So this is my second video in the history series with Hannah. So she's taking us around Edinburgh to discuss historical figures within Edinburgh in the LBGTQ plus community. It was really fascinating and I really hope you enjoy it too. There. So we're going to do a brief tour of a few sites in Edinburgh that are related to Scottish LGBTQ plus history. So yeah, we're here at the castle as you can see, it's very pretty. Um, so yeah, we're going to start here. So King James VI was born in Edinburgh Castle behind me here in 1566. And he ended up becoming King of Scotland when he was just one year old. So James VI was the son of Mary Queen of Scots, one of our most famous monarchs. In 1603, he also became the King of England when Elizabeth I died without having any kids. And his long reign is remembered for all sorts of things, from the King James Bible to literal witch hunts and for the religious persecution of Catholics. But he was also known for his relationships with men. He had several what they called male favourites, and perhaps his most famous was the handsome George Villiers, who he also made into the first Duke of Buckingham. You have all these letters that survive between them, where they have this kind of erotic sexual tone between the two of them. There's one where George even reminisces about them seeming to be in bed together. Lots of historians have tried to claim that there was nothing romantic about James's relationships with men, but to me it honestly seems pretty unlikely that we never had a queer monarch in all of our history, and I think James is a pretty good candidate. Yeah, so within the castle you had a little royal palace inside, yeah. uh, and that's where he was born. His mum was actually living at Holyrood Palace at the time, but Edinburgh Castle was considered a safer place for royal women to go and give birth because it was so defended. Okay, well, yeah. Yeah, because there used to be a moat, wasn't there, around the castle at the time, so... Yeah, absolutely, and you're up on this big rock, so it's pretty difficult to break into Edinburgh Castle. Yeah. Okay, so Hannah, where are we now? So, we're now outside Waterston's bookshop, and you would never know to look at it, but back in the 1980s, this was a gay nightclub, right in the heart of Edinburgh. It actually opened in 1978, which is three years before homosexuality was even decriminalised in Scotland. So it's pretty amazing that they managed to have such a prominent space here on Princess Street. It was famous for performing dance music and for having legends like Eartha Kitt and the village people come to perform. It was a truly iconic venue that made it onto lists of the best 50 clubs in the world, gay or straight, and people would travel from all over the country to come and dance here at Fire Island. It was eventually sold in 1988 to turn into the bookshop that it is today, but not without leaving a legacy for Edinburgh. It even spawned another queer venue that we'll hear about later on, called Lavender Menace Bookshop, which started out selling queer literature in the club cloakroom. Well, actually, to start with, it was a straight nightclub, and they had a gay night once a week, right. but apparently the straight club lost their alcohol licence because there was always so much trouble, and okay. the police said, if you turn it into a gay club full-time, mm -hmm. we'll give you the alcohol license because they never got trouble on the gay night wow. so even before homosexuality was decriminalized there was kind of an acceptance coming in i never knew that there was actually a nightclub on princess street me neither because no. <laughs> now you just think shops on princess yeah. street but this really used to be like part of the nightlife scene in the city wow. So we're now here at Bristol Square, which is part of Edinburgh University. Yeah, and I wanted to come here to talk about one of the first women to go to any British university at all, back in 1869. Her name was Sophia Jex Blake, and she was the kind of leader of a group known as the Edinburgh Seven. They were the first women who were allowed into any British universities. Before that, no women were permitted entry at all. Sophia Jex Blake had first applied on her own, actually, and the university said, we can't make arrangements for just one lady so she went away and put adverts in the newspapers to get other women to come and join in her application and eventually it was seven of them who got admitted so they studied for their whole degree here for four years and they faced a lot of prejudice but they had support amongst the student body as well and then eventually in 1873 the university decided that they shouldn't be allowed to graduate and it was nothing to do with their academic performance. They were all amazing. They all had to be extra amazing to be there alongside the men at a time that was so sexist towards women. 
Uh, but the university said it was a mistake to let women in. They were going back on it completely and they wouldn't let them graduate. But Sophia and the other women that she studied with mostly went abroad and got medical degrees in other countries in Europe that were a little bit more forward thinking at the time. So she actually did come back as Scotland's first female doctor in 1878, but she wasn't allowed to study here. So she was practicing as a doctor here before the university started letting women in all the time. And when she came back, as well as setting up practice as a doctor, she also set up a medical school for women. And that's where she met her girlfriend, Margaret Todd. So they would spend the next 25 years of their lives together and they retired down to the Sussex countryside together in 1899. We can't be 100% sure that they were a couple because they had to be so secretive about it. But nowadays people do pretty much think that they were life partners and not just kind of two very good friends who lived together for 25 years. So I think it's amazing that on top of everything she had to fight for as a woman, she was also a lesbian and had to keep that part of her identity a secret while she was pursuing all of these medical ambitions. The university let her and her six other applicants in, the Edinburgh Seven, in 1869. But when they stopped them from graduating in 1873, after that, they didn't let any women come in until 1892. So they never got their ceremony, they never got their degree? Or... From Edinburgh, they eventually got given their degree by the University of Edinburgh in 2019. 2019? So, yes, 2019. Oh <laughs> so they actually had seven modern female medical students accept their degree on their behalf. But yeah, most of the women did go on to become doctors anyway. They just had to travel abroad and do their medical degree all over again, which I think tells you something about how dedicated they were to that ambition. Right. And where abroad do you know? So Sophia Jex Blake qualified in Bern in Switzerland and uh, some of the others qualified in Paris. So both Switzerland and France were a little bit more open to women studying medicine or studying at all at the time. She lived in Brunsfield with her partner Margaret Todd so you can still go and see the house that they lived in which has now been transformed into flats but it was first their house and then an expansion of the hospital that they had run together. So where are we now? <laughs> so we're now in George Square. We're standing just at the end of a street called Windmill Street. And back over 200 years ago, this street was home to a surgeon from Edinburgh University called James Barry. He actually grew up in Cork in Ireland, but he came to Edinburgh to study medicine in 1809. When he graduated in 1812, he joined the British Army as a surgeon. And he ended up having this really groundbreaking career working all over the British Empire, as it was at the time. He was also a real pioneer in obstetric medicine, so he performed one of the first recorded caesarean sections where the mother and the baby both survived the operation back in the 1820s, so that would have been done without anaesthetic at the time, which makes that even more amazing, I know. <laughs> and he was also really into campaigning for better living conditions, and you would think as an army doctor he would be more focused on the soldiers, but he was also really interested in the local people in the various different countries he lived in and he understood how important it was to give people better living conditions to avoid things like outbreaks of cholera and other diseases that spread really easily. So he had this really amazing medical career. He worked in, in India, in Malta, in Jamaica, in South Africa and then he retired in about 1859 down to London and when he died a few years later he had left instructions that he didn't want his body to be prepared for his funeral so he didn't want an autopsy, he didn't want to be like washed and dressed for burial or anything but somebody ignored those instructions and it turned out that he had been assigned female at birth and remember this is at a time when nobody who either was a woman or was perceived as a woman would be able to go to university or join the army or anything like that. Actually like a lot of the people who knew him didn't seem to be that bothered by this information. There's letters that they wrote afterwards and they're all kind of like well, he was a great doctor, I don't really care. I thought maybe there was something unusual about him, but it didn't bother me. But the army was so freaked out by this that they ordered all of the records about him to be sealed up for a hundred years, basically 
let's make it someone else's problem once we're all dead. And now that his story has started to become more widely known, I think there's a lot of interest in him as someone who pioneered living outside the gender he was assigned at birth. So you will sometimes hear people refer to him as Britain's first female doctor, but I really feel like we owe him the respect of using the name and the pronouns that he chose for himself in life, even though we don't know for sure how he identified privately. But certainly if he had carried on presenting as female, he would not have been allowed to go to university in 1809. He wouldn't have been able to pursue the career that he wanted. But equally, it could have been as much a, a reason to go and live as himself as anything else. You know, maybe he chose to go off and become a doctor so that he could live as a man mm -hmm. um, rather than living as a man to become a doctor. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. So yeah, this is one of the streets that he lived on. Yes, yeah. there's records of him living various places right. around the university area, but Windmill Street is one of the places where he lived. Right. Although I think the building he actually lived in has been demolished oh, to really? build this lovely car park that you can see here. <laughs> uh, but certainly there's records of him living on this street. Yeah, there's nothing named after him no. that I'm aware of, unless it's happened more recently, because his records were sealed up until the 1960s. Right. Uh, so it's only really recent recently that people have become more aware of his story mm -hmm. and even more recently than that that anyone has even really considered the fact that he may have been trans right. um, as opposed to people thinking he had had to hide his identity. Okay, so we've come to West Nicholson Street. Yeah, we're now just in front of Lighthouse Bookshop, which is okay. my favourite bookshop in the city, mm -hmm. uh, and I totally recommend everyone check them out. They sell stuff online too. But the reason I really wanted to come and talk about queer books in Edinburgh at this site is because back in 2017, this bookshop hosted a pop-up event by a legendary venue from the 1980s in Edinburgh called Lavender Menace Bookshop. So Lavender Menace actually started out selling literature from the cloakroom in Fire Island and within a couple of years they had become so popular they were able to get their own premises which were on 4th Street just off Broughton Street at the kind of east end of Princess Street. But they initially opened just a year after the decriminalisation of homosexuality in Scotland so they had to kind of operate a bit cleverly. They sometimes had to lie about their names and addresses to bring queer books in from America and avoid being charged with obscenity. They operated there up until 1988 until they got their own even bigger premises in the heart of the city centre on Dundas Street. But sadly they shut down in the late 90s because with the rise of the internet and also a kind of unexpected side effect I guess of the mainstream becoming more accepting of queer people is that specifically queer bookshops began to struggle because these things were available more in mainstream spaces than they used to be. But in 2017 there was a play written about Lavender Menace called Love Song to Lavender Menace. It was by a guy called James Lay. It's kind of set on the night that the bookshop is moving premises between the two different places and it has their employees reminiscing about what this place has meant to people. So as part of that they hosted a pop-up session here at Lighthouse Bookshop which was run by the people who ran the original shop. Their name are Bob Orr and Sigrid Nielsen. It really tried to kind of capture the spirit of why places like this were so important to people. And I think it's really easy for us to forget nowadays that we have the internet and all of this information at our fingertips that if you were a queer person or a trans person growing up in Edinburgh in 1982, you needed a physical place like this to go and find books with other people like you who understood your experiences. I can see how places like this would be a lifeline back then with no internet, and even with health related things as well. People were writing books that were really far out there. And yeah, absolutely. I think it gave people access to the stories of lives like theirs for the first time. I mean, it's so impossible to wrap your head around now, but there were really people growing up in Scotland in the 70s who thought they were the only gay person in the world and who thought there was something wrong with them because there was just no representation of anyone in a positive light at all. The fact that these spaces were operating in the 80s when it had just become legal to be gay, but also you kind of mentioned the health thing as well, like they're operating during the AIDS crisis at a time when the government was making no effort to take care of queer people who were contracting HIV and dying of AIDS. So having a queer space that was interested in that kind of thing and that cared about your health and you having knowledge about that was hugely physically important as well as important for people's mental well-being. Oh, 
<laughs> and the L L. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I think I'm just like ready to have a nap now. <laughs> <Just once. laughs> Historical figures, does that mean? Because <laughs> like magic, we've moved yeah. from where we were before. I enjoyed that one. <laughs> <laughs> 